Hey guys, how are you doing? It's a Sunday morning, like super early. I don't know like how many of you struggled waking up this morning, but I really did. But yeah, I'm glad that all of you could make it here. Um, it's a really interesting day, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to everyone who's going to be speaking as well. It's really interesting. So um, I created this chatbot called Bus Uncle, uh, and through this presentation, I'm just going to tell you a story of how it came to be. And I know that this is more of a UX design kind of theme talk, so I tried to put in as much of that in my presentation as much as possible, even though I'm just a developer and I have no idea what design is. So a lot of you might point and laugh at me and say that's wrong, but please do so at the end of the presentation. So um, bus uncle, right? How it came to be was, um, I was just at a bus stop in Orchard Road one day. Right? I was just standing there, just like all these people with my head turned right, waiting for the bus to arrive. And I just kept thinking to myself, how long is the bus going to take to arrive to my bus stop? Right? All these different people had different uh, like, things they had to do in the day, but everyone's just standing there and waiting. So the thing is, in Singapore, uh, we are a very high-tech city, and we actually have these things, electronic boards that actually show us bus arrival timings behind. You can actually look at these boards and know exactly when your next bus will arrive and when your uh, subsequent bus after that will arrive as well. But on that one day to me, I felt it was just a little too much. Like, why do I have to look through a whole list and try to find my one single bus that I'm trying to wait for, right? And in Singapore, we also have a lot of different apps. So you install an app, uh, it looks just like, I mean, these are a couple of examples. Uh, and the thing is, these apps also didn't make me feel right that day. For some reason, when I opened the app, I was like, there's a lot of information. And to find how long I have to wait for that one particular bus that I was waiting for, right, bus 65, I had to scroll through a list, I had to type in where I was, and I was also given like a massive amount of splashed information that I had to find my little one bus uh, in, in answer from. So the thing is, in my head, I just asked, I wish I could ask someone, right? I wish I could ask someone how long I have to wait. And this one person would just tell me seven minutes. Like, that's it. I didn't want to go through a whole list or go and install a whole new app for it. And that's how Bus Uncle came to be. So I, I, I decided I'm going to try to build something like this. So in October 2016, uh, I mean, I actually thought of this in October 2016, but Facebook actually released a new platform on Messenger called the Messenger platform, which allows third-party developers to come in and build bots, build these services on top of their Messenger platform which means if you chatted with something on Facebook, it would reply back to you, just like a little program. These are called chatbots, right? So I thought that Facebook released this in April 2016. It was October 2016, so I thought, okay, maybe I can go try to build a chatbot. So I went and built Bus Uncle. So if you guys haven't tried it yet, you can access Bus Uncle like, through this link, m.me slash sgbusuncle. You can talk to Bus Uncle the whole time. Uh, it's fine. I'll probably be saying the same thing he's going to tell you as well. So for those of you who are still watching, um, when you talk to Bus Uncle, right, you can literally just say hi or hello, Uncle, and he responds with an ah. So then he gives you an option that says bus how long. You click on it. You enter the bus you're waiting for. Or you, and then he tells you, like, where are you now? And then you can say Maple Tree. We're all in Maple Tree now. And he shows you all the bus stops in Maple Tree, and you just click Choose. And he'll say, OK, still got 10 minutes. Go get groceries. So Bus Uncle tells you about your bus arrival timings, right? This is actually a really long conversation. Uh, right now, most users actually just uh, say what they're looking for in one message. They say, I'm at Maple Tree looking for bus 10. How long do I have to wait? Then he just says 10 minutes. But this is just an example to show you another flow that shows like much more functionality there. So Bus Uncle also does public transportation directions. So you can ask him, how can I get to NUS from here? Right? Or how can I go home? You can actually ask him, how can you go home? 
And um, he'll show you all the different options you can take, like the green line and which bus you can take. And when you click on choose, he'll show you step-by-step -step directions on how to get to wherever you want to be. So what's interesting about Bus Uncle is you, you speak to him like a real person, right? So you can actually tell him, I'm late, right? And if you tell him I'm late, he's going to be like, OK, let me find you the fastest way there. But you can also tell him things like, I'm poor. <laughs> and if you, if you tell him I'm poor, he'll find you the route that's the cheapest way there. So he's, he's programmed to understand like, a lot more human expressions like this. Uh, a more recent feature that was implemented recently is some users ask, where is the bus? So this actually came, to, came about because uh, when I was tracking the data, I realized a lot of people, when they're waiting for their bus, they seemed very kiasu. So <laughs> if, for the non-Singaporeans here, kiasu means afraid to lose. Right? So they just kept asking bus uncle, bus how long, bus how long, where, where, bus how long, where. <laughs> and then I decided, OK, a lot of people are actually asking where. So I, I realized I had this information, and I, I could just plot it on a little map with Google Maps. So then I implemented where is the bus. Now when people say where, he says, nah, here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, Bus Uncle does public transport updates. So if ever your bus is affected by uh, like a nationwide like uh, rerouting of the buses, this most common during F1 times in Singapore, whenever they set up the Formula One tracks, they have to reroute a lot of buses and a lot of bus stops are disabled. Um, sometimes you can ask him about it, and then he'll say, sorry, they got F1. So he's, he'll tell you you can't use the bus, and you can go check the affected bus list, and he'll show you alternatives as well. So this is a few different things that Bus Uncle does, all through chat. It's just a chatbot. So I've bu I built Bus Uncle over a year ago, and I realized through all the, uh, the data I'm getting and through all the learnings I've seen from the community, I realize chatbots are actually bringing us a lot more closer to the future because conversations bring us closer to humans. Think about it. Like when you have an app or when you have a website, you're building a UI. You're building a user interface. You're saying this button's going to be here. There's going to be an input field here for users to put in stuff. And you're actually trying to show the user how you want them to use your own app or your own website. But the difference in conversations is you don't tell them how to speak to the bot. They just be themselves. Humans don't really need to learn. Rather, they just speak and say, can this be done? Or can I do this? Or can you just tell me the answer to what I'm looking for? So it's bringing us a lot more closer to human nature. right? And this is going to be leveraged upon a lot more. So. All the, I mean, even now on like social media websites, you see screenshots of conversations being posted everywhere. People love speaking to each other on messaging apps, right? So the leftmost picture is uh, a screenshot I took off of a popular platform called SGAG, uh, which frequently shows screenshots of conversations that are funny between people. And we actually laugh at it because we can relate and we feel human about it and understand the kind of rapport that was going on between those two people. You also see like screenshots of people ranting. Like uh, the, the middle screenshot actually came from this article that says, my ex-girlfriend never paid me back my money. So <laughs> he took a screenshot of like a whole conversation and everybody just kept commenting on it. They're like, I totally get you, man. And finally, like you have your own personal conversations, right? You can share ideas. So when to, to speak is kind of to be human. So there's data showing that a lot more users now are actually shifting to using messaging apps a lot more than social media. So in this graph from Business Insider, the green line you see is the number of active users on the big four messaging apps. And the blue line is the number of total users or active users on the big four social networking apps. The big four messaging apps are WhatsApp, uh, WeChat, 
Tel Telegram, and Viber. And the big four social networking apps are Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. There's a lot more users hanging out in your messaging apps now. They're moving away from social media. So what does this mean? This means the majority of users are focusing their attention in messaging. And that's why people started creating chatbots, so that people can speak to your services through these messaging apps. So I'll take a step back and try to reintroduce what a chatbot is. Right? For those of you who still are not, uh, don't understand what it really is, a chatbot is an intelligent chat assistant. It has, it has one on one conversations with you, or it can be put in your group conversations, and it could facilitate a chat for you negotiate in the group for you. And these chatbots perform tasks and services, very simply put. So they can connect to a backend, they can connect to APIs, they can do math. They just perform tasks and services. So back to the point of conversations and being human, right? The point I wanted to make was um, conversations enhance human connection. So what this really means is I'm actually going to break, break, the word, break the phrase human connection down into the two words, human and connection. So let's say now you're trying to build a chatbot, or your company's decided we're going to build a new chatbot, a new chat interface. And the thing is, if you want to enhance human connection, we really need to think about what humans are, especially when they're having conversations. So. In general, well, this is not a perfect example of what a human is, but I'd say when humans are speaking in conversations, they tend to do three things, right? They tend to be very natural. That means they don't say, uh, they don't pretend to be a robot. They don't say, I'm, I say next to play the next song or previous to play the previous song or click X to close the exit sign. Instead, humans say things like, uh, I'm bored of this song, like sh show me a next song. So they tend to be natural. Another thing is humans are also very, I mean, revolve around a very particular culture. This culture does not have to restrict itself to being a geographical culture, but it could be a culture of how they are brought up, what their interests are in. So, for example, people who are really interested into land games, uh, Counter-Strike games or stuff, they commonly use the words lead, noob, and headshot in all their conversations. And this stuff actually has to be understood by your chatbot. So we need, really need to think about like, the culture that humans are in. And finally, when humans are speaking to chatbots, they really, really like to participate. Very simply put, this means your chatbot should not be doing all the work. Rather, it should be collaborating with a human, getting their inputs, and having a cooperative conversation to be able to like, come up with an answer or come up with whatever they're looking for. So, okay, before I move on to the next slides, I know the majority of you here are designers, right? So, how many of you have ever felt overwhelmed by developers in your company? Or how many of you have felt that uh, these, the developers are not able to understand what you're trying to say, and therefore you're just, I mean, you just can't communicate with them. Okay, cool. So a few of you have actually felt this. So chatbots now um, are actually being created a lot by developers. And the typical developer mindset for conversation design is actually really not that good. So. When chatbots are built by developers, the majority of them say, my chatbot will be smart and answer all the questions that the users will ask. And best of all, it's AI, so it will self-learn. Right? This is probably something you've seen on ch chatbot marketing all over Facebook or all over like, other websites you see. And developers, when they think of building chatbots, they only think about uh, well, I won't say all developers, most developers, they only think about the technicals behind it. They think about the artificial intellig intelligence, the natural language processing, enti entities, intents, automation, analytics. And they say the chatbot will have to give you answers and answers and answers. 
So because most chatbots have been tried out and experimented only by developers, the results for most chatbots in the world today are actually not that good. So take a look at this example. The NBA. The NBA is a huge organization, the National Basketball Association. Uh, the NBA had a chatbot, and someone's just asking for the name of Larry Bird, who's a basketball player, and the chatbot says, please type in the NBA Finals player's name. So it's just not able to understand. And you can see some other examples here where the, the chatbot says, uh, sorry, I didn't get that, or I'm not sure what you meant, I'm sorry about that. Or some chatbots are like stuck in a constant radio loop where they say, please select an option, please select an option, please select an option. Even though you're trying to change the context, it's not working. So the thing is, uh, there's good news for you guys. Even though chatbots don't really seem to have a, a lot of design on the on this, uh, surface of it, a lot of design actually has to go into building conversations as well. So when we build a chatbot, we should design for the human, damn it. Like, essentially, the humans are people that says, I just asked for help. I just wanted the chatbot to answer my questions. So humans have very, very natural uh, characteristics like feelings, experiences. And when they speak to chatbots, the mid a lot of them will tend to be very, very random with your chatbots. And like, like for example, Bas Uncle, a lot of users actually ask him, where's Bas Auntie? Or <laughs> and a really common finding is a lot of users, when they start a new conversation with a new chatbot, they, they just tend to like, be very naughty and try to play around with swear words all the way in the start. So you can see users saying, fuck, fuck, fuck. But the chatbots, just like, I mean, most chatbots are not um, able to understand that. So the thing is, humans, when they speak to chatbots, they tend to ask things like questions, they put out expressions, and they try to be cooperative with the chatbot. So this is how, I guess, when we think of designing a conversational experience, we really got to think about who's the human behind it. And in the end, conversation design is all about the loop between what the developers can do and what the, what the humans can give, right? So the developers can say, uh, uh, my chatbot is powered by AI and it has NLP and it, it, it gets all this data and it gives these answers. But at the same time, it should keep learning and the designer should keep sh saying that, or keep uh, telling the developers that don't just do that. Uh, humans tend to be natural when speaking to the chatbot. So that's where that comes in. So this is how a chatbot constantly develops. Now the second part of conversations and the human connection is the connection part of it. And what this means is chatbots are inherently social and chatbots can actually be used to help a community. So think about it, like chatbots exist on messaging apps, right? They exist on Facebook. They exist on WeChat, they exist on Viber. All these are actually social networks. These networks actually allow you to connect people together. And because of that, there's a huge advantage that these chatbots have. So let's compare an experience from a chatbot to an experience from an app, like a typical app on your phone. So apps produce generally isolated, unrelated experiences. Right? And every new app you install has a learning curve. When you install it, you gotta look at the user interface, you gotta figure out how to use it. And there's a typical onboarding flow where you gotta log in, register, and you gotta register and log in for every single new app that you have. So they tend to be generally be very top down. So if there are two apps from two competitors, they try to get the same information from different users and they try to provide individual isolated experiences to these different users. So this is actually not that efficient because you don't want your users con continually always registering a new account every time they act, they have a new service, things like that, right? Well, let's take a look at bots. Bots, chatbots, they live on social networks. And when they live on social networks, it means they can connect to people 
and they can connect to each other as well. It's really interesting. So one bot, imagine one bot has spoken to these three users, but the second bot hasn't spoken to these three users. The thing is, if, if the second bot and this first bot come to a partnership, the first bot can actually pass all this information to the second bot, and that way the user doesn't even have to register or go log in to use the second bot. It already has the information about you. So it's all on the social networks. And what's nice is because it's on a social network, it's on a familiar and inherently social interface. So inherently, I mean, like, essentially, these eliminate the friction of apps. So now back to Bus Uncle, right? So enough of my lecture. So Bus Uncle went viral. When Bus Uncle was launched, um, essentially in the start, he had a very few users, like maybe 200 or 300, but he got picked up by a lot of social journalism websites. And I remember, OK, let's go back to the story. I launched Bus Uncle on October 26th, 2016, October 25th, 2016. And a few days in, I had been getting like, oh, the way I launched it is I actually put it on my own social, on my Facebook profile. So essentially, as I told my own friends, hey, guys, I released a new bot called Bus Uncle. Just go try it out. It was literally just meant for my own friends on Facebook, not meant for anyone else. But the thing about Bus Uncle is my friends really enjoyed having conversations with him that they started screenshotting the conversations and started posting it on their profiles. So when they did that, their friends, who were not my friends, also started using Bus Uncle. And those were people that I did not intend Bus Uncle to, to be users of. So that way, Bus Uncle actually spread virally for a few days. I got maybe 20 new users, 30 new users every day. But just on the fifth day that he was out, Bus Uncle uh, like was seen by a really popular social journalism website called Mothership.sg. If some of you uh, might know that they're really, really popular amongst millennials here in Singapore. So when Mothership had their eyes on Bus Uncle, they actually published an article about Bus Uncle without contacting me first. And they published that article about Bus Uncle, and that was a day of a hell for me. Because when they did that, I got so many new users. Um, so to give you a uh, perspective, I remember it was on a Friday. On a Friday at 2 PM, I had about 220 users at most. And just four hours passed by. It went to 6 PM. Oh, wait, mothership.sg posted the article at 2.30. And about at 6 PM, I had like 8,500 users speaking to Bus Uncle. So that was, I mean, it, it's good. It's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have. But the thing is, I literally just meant Bus Uncle to be just for my friends on Facebook. So he wasn't intended to handle all that traffic. I used free versions of everything that said, you can have a maximum of this many users, right? And when that happened, essentially, when 8,000 people were trying to speak Bus Uncle at the same time, naturally, he just kept crashing, right? So I remember that day was like really, really uh, stressful for me because I had to just keep going to my web server and say, restart, 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 like every 10 minutes, just to make sure that the new users who came in got a little bit of the Bus Uncle experience. And over time, Bus Uncle actually got viral. People started sharing more about him. And also, on the back end, on my side, I actually was developing the infrastructure for it to be able to handle a lot more load. So now he's stable. Now it's fine. But Bus Uncle actually did go viral. And a lot of people ask me, what do you think made your chatbot go viral? Because I've seen a lot of chatbots out there, and they suck. Um, I wouldn't say this is like the perfect answer to it. This is just my perspective to it. But I boiled it down to these three points. One is Bas Uncle has a very unique personality. Right? He's snarky, he's witty, he's grumpy. And you speak to him, he might scold you sometimes. And then you, <laughs> you, you, you complain about the bus being late, he'll scold you back and say, just wait, like stop complaining. So he has a very, very unique personality that kind of allows the people in Singapore to be reminded of a typical grumpy uncle here in Singapore. 
and that makes them actually feel for it. So most people don't actually call bus uncle bus uncle. They actually call him uncle. So it's very typical of Singaporeans or people residing in Singapore to call their uh, older people uncle and auntie. So it's something they could relate to. There's a culture around there. So one thing is he had a very unique personality and the culture really made sense. Another thing is Bas Uncle has a non-linear conversational flow. Uh, this essentially means he can speak to you and your random messages you send him. A lot of chatbots, they depend on a very linear conversation where you start with a message A and it has to end at a message B. And if you try to jump off in the middle, the chatbot will say either I don't understand or it'll just be like that radio loop again that says Tell me, it, tell, uh, tell me where you are, tell me where you are, tell me where you are. But Bas Uncle, I tried to design him in such a way that anyone could speak to anything to him and uh, he'd, ha he'd just have to try to understand what they're trying to say. It's called nonlinear conversational flow. Another more popular term for it is called random access navigation. So you guys can like go Google that as well. Um, yeah, so for, for example, if you're speaking to him and asking him for a bus, you can say, I'm at Maple Tree. Then he'll say, okay, you're at Maple Tree. Then which bus are you looking for? Then suddenly you get random, right? You say, oh, I'm feeling sleepy. You, you actually tell, I'm feeling sleepy to bus uncle. Most other chatbots will be like, that's not a bus. But, but bus uncle says, go sleep la. <laughs> and finally, the really, really important thing, uh, that Bas Uncle does, that a lot of chatbots fail to do, is he gives you answers. Very simply put, a chatbot must give you answers. You speak to a chatbot, it starts probing you with a lot of questions. Users will always tend to like, just drop off. They're going to be like, I don't want to be questioned by this robot. Like, just give me what I'm looking for. He gives you answers up front. You tell him exactly where you are. I'm at bus stop 50119 and I'm waiting for bus 95 or something like that. And he'll say, yeah, three minutes. He gives you exactly what you're looking for. So that's also important. And that's a reason why he went viral. People found utility in that. So after bus uncle, um, I decided to, to take some of these learnings and go and join a really big hackathon called Startup Weekend Singapore that Gail was just talking about. She was one of the organizers. And my team and I decided to use some of these practices to design another chatbot called Ketchup. Ketchup is your local travel companion in Medan, Indonesia. It's, it's really, really different from what Bas Uncle does here in Singapore. It's because we wanted to try something new, a whole new vertical, a whole new uh, geographical territory. And in this example, what Ketchup is doing is he's just saying, Hey, you've landed at the airport. Let me take you to your hotel. So when the user says, cool, let's go, he actually gives you like very local uh, tribal information that's actually really hard to find online. He says, don't take the Ubers here, or don't take the Grabs here. And he says, uh, you should not take that because they're actually really dangerous. You should just take these blue, blue cabs called Bluebirds, and they're a lot more safer. So he gives you this, like, this tribal information that's actually normally hard to find. And also, it's, it's really fast here, I'm sorry, I can't really show you, but um, the user says, the cab driver speaking to me in Bahasa, Indonesia, I don't understand. So the user is saying, Ketchup, help me. So then what Ketchup does is, he says, okay, let me translate this for you. He shows them a whole Indonesian paragraph, and he says, show this to your driver. So we, we designed, I mean, this is one example of a travel chatbot that we did. And we went ahead and we won, we won Startup Weekend. Um, it says we won $50,000, but it's in prizes, so there's no real cash. <laughs> yeah, but it's good. Like, we all got iPhone 10s and drones and stuff, so it's good. Um, but essentially, what we learned from this was those, those practices hold true. Like those attributes of good chatbots actually hold true. And we tried to apply it to catch up. So I guess takeaways on a chatbot design, right? Like when you think about when you design a chatbot, when you design a conversational user interface, what do you really need to think about? 
First things first, foremost, very important, leverage on the power of conversation. Don't make your chatbot just blast out information to the users all the time and not understand what the user is trying to say. Don't use chat, a chatbot as a tool just to uh, get new users, but rather use it as a tool to understand users more. It's because humans, the people be speaking behind the chatbots, the humans are the heroes when you build your chatbot, right? The chatbots are not the hero. The humans are the heroes. And the chatbots are just like the sidekicks that are trying to help them what they want, but everything you do in a chatbot needs to be about the person speaking to it. And finally, chatbots live on social networks. It's a huge advantage. Like They can connect people together. They can connect to each other together. Like Use that as an advantage. That's That'll, that, that, that'll, that'll get you like a huge marketing boost. So, also, what's the future, right? What's the future of chatbots? Uh, some, do you guys know who Andreessen Horowitz is? So, Andreessen Horowitz is a really, really popular VC in the U.S., a venture capitalist who invests a lot in tech startups and deep, deep tech startups. So they actually predicted that in the next five years, people are going to be asking, where's the NLP version of this? Or rather, how can I speak to your service? Like, I don't want to download an app. I don't want to go to your website. Like, how can I speak to your service? They say chatbots are going to be so prevalent that almost every service is actually going to be able to speak to you. So chatbots are definitely going to be a lot more prevalent in the future. Um, also, they can talk to each other, as I had shown you about the, the network side of it. And finally, chatbots are actually not the future. Like, because, ch because chatbots are just the first step to the future. There's going to be a lot more instant services with voice, with touch, with visuals. People are inventing VR, people are inventing AR. Is getting a lot more prevalent, and a lot more services are going to be consumed in a lot more ways than just clicking buttons on a cell phone screen. So, chatbots is just the first step that shows that services can be provided in a different way than clicking buttons on a screen. But it's going to it's going to evolve. There's going to be a lot more different services. Um, so the vision of Bus Uncle Company, which is uh, the company that I'm uh, doing right now, that we are building chatbots who are AI friends who collaborate to solve a citizen's problems. So I showed you about Ketchup, right? So Ketchup was actually like one chatbot, but because we want to leverage on the power of social, we want these chatbots to talk to each other. So one thing we want to do is when users speak to Ketchup and say, how can I get... I'm in Singapore now. How can I get to MBS? Ketchup will say, hold on, let me get my friend Bus Uncle. And Bus Uncle suddenly comes to the user from the back and says, oh, hey, Ketchup told me you're looking for directions to MBS. Here, take Bus 57 from here. So we want to build these different services that actually collaborate in the back to help you get shit done. Yeah. Um, what we're doing right now, and this is more marketing materials, what we're doing right now is uh, brand partnerships and chatbot development uh, under the Bus Uncle company. So brand partnerships is with Bus Uncle, because he gets so much traffic, because he has a lot of fans and followers, he's kind of like an influencer. So we've actually partnered with some big brands before, like MasterCard and BBC. Um, and we actually help them communicate some of their products and services through Bus Uncle's voice in your conversation. Some of you may have seen it, some of you have, may have not. But essentially, Bus Uncle is Singapore's only AI influencer right now. So we do brand partnerships. And we also do chatbot development. Uh, this is to help you and your company build your first chatbot and make it really awesome. So if you're interested, you can just talk to me after this. And that's us, Bus Uncle. You guys have questions? Yes.
Right. Thanks for that. Uh, those are fair questions. Uh, so the first question was about culture, right? Sometimes when you try to build a chatbot that tries to fit a particular culture, you might actually be missing out some, on some other users outside this, this culture and kind of be destructive and a kind of destructive experience with them. So how do I mitigate that? Well, uh, I'm actually seeing the majority of foreigners who don't understand Singlish actually have a positive experience with, the, with Bas Uncle. This is because the foreigners who are living here in Singapore who know Singlish is a really common medium of language actually tell their friends who are coming into Singapore and, and, and tell them, if you want to learn Singlish, talk to Bas Uncle. So, <laughs> so that's actually really interesting. I wasn't expecting that. I was, I was thinking it's going to be something like what you said, that uh, foreigners just wouldn't understand and they just not use Bas Uncle. Um, but then, it's, you're right, I do have some users who really don't understand Bas Uncle and they've given me two star, three star ratings just because they say I don't understand. But that's fine. That's, that was a risk I'm, I was willing to take anyway. Um, so, about the culture part of it, yeah. Uh, it's, again, it's just about building a product that people really will love, like, right? As a user researcher in general, we always got to characterize who our final user is going to be. It's very similar to the culture part of the user of a chatbot. It, we just really need to formulize who's going to be speaking to the chatbot and who's the majority of the people who's going to be speaking to the chatbot and build it for them. Like we can't build a chatbot that's going to solve all users' problems and be comfortable with all users. Like one example is a lot of people in Singapore don't really talk to a Siri or Alexa but it's a lot more popular in the US. There's, that's a culture part of it as well. Um, the second part of the question was, you've built two products, they're both male. How is that affecting your views or, or why did you come to that decision? So uh, you're right. Um, we could have built another female chatbot as well. And this was actually something that we hadn't really thought about very deeply into. When we, built it that, when we built that persona yet. But it is very, very important to like, make sure that your chatbot either has a gender or doesn't have a gender as well. There's a lot of research articles that, that say um, Siri and Alexa, because they tend to be women, people don't actually really use it for what it's intended to. Like, uh, it's... Uh, I mean, in, in, to put it bluntly, a lot more males actually sexually harass these chatbots. It's really weird to think about it, but this actually is a problem. Um, I have a friend who built a female chatbot here in Singapore. Uh, the, the female chatbot, her name is Tushin Jieje. I'm not sure if he, he's here. Okay, he's not here. So Tushin Jieje is a chatbot. Uh, who finds you ne the nearest tutors around your area, you can go and book tut like, tutoring lessons with them, right? And he built it around the personality of a JJ. A JJ is uh, basically being sister. And the, 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 the avatar of JJ is like a really beautiful girl. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to show of tutoring. I don't really understand why I did that, but it's just a, a really beautiful girl in the form of cartoon. And when he launched this, a week after he launched this, he came to me and he said, hey, a lot of guys are harassing my chatbot. What do I do? <laughs> so um, this is a real problem, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm really not sure what the, the answer to this is, but... I guess to try to mitigate some of these problems or to be on the safer side, 
in general. Either make your chatbot have no gender at all, or the second safest option is maybe to make them male. But the thing is, I also launched a bus auntie. So bus uncle is not alone in this. In April this year, I introduced his wife, bus auntie, who is his wife. And uh, now sometimes users can speak to bus uncle, and sometimes they speak to bus auntie as well. So I tried to, I tried to like reduce this, the, the pressure in that area from that as well. Yeah. Are there any other questions? There was this facility in Bus Uncle called uh, Tickle Uncle, and I see it's not there anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm more interested in hearing the story behind it. Like, what was the feedback that ended up in you removing Tickle Uncle? Because it was very nice. You used to say, "Stop laugh, Why are you tickling me?" and so on. <laughs> As you can see, Bus Uncle is very ridiculous. So <laughs> Tickle Uncle still exists. It's not been removed yet. Oh really? Or oh, oh, it might, might be a bug. I'll go fix that later. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, essentially, what the uncle is is a form of pagination. If you guys know what pagination is, it literally means if you have a lot of information, you got to try to group it into clusters and make these clusters navigable between each other. So a very common form is on Tumblr and on WordPress. When you see like 20 posts, then at the bottom of the page, you say you, have to, you want to go to page two. And essentially, that's paginating information. Similarly, for Bus Uncle, when you search for a bus stop, sometimes he gives you a lot more bus stops than Facebook Messenger is allowed to show. Facebook Messenger is allowed to show a maximum of 11 different items and a go. So if, for example, someone searched for Orchard, which has a lot of bus stops, maybe 22 bus stops, the last, the last item that you can click is this one little card which has a button called Tickle Uncle on it. And uh, essentially when you click Tickle Uncle, he just says, ha ha, okay, I'll show you more results. <laughs> it's just a form of pagination. Yeah. And it's, it's literally meant to be like weird and fun. And uh, the feedback I got in general was, uh, it's, no one had like negative views of it. A lot of people like just burst out laughing about it. And I've been tracking the data as well, and it says users, there have been positive sentiments from a user's response after they clicked on Tickle Uncle, which is weird. But yeah, <laughs> it's just to, to add to the, the culture point of view. So to make Bus Uncle cute or fun, I just added that in. Okay, great. Any other questions? Because I do have one question, if no one's going. One last question? Okay, so because you know, being having a bot is an emerging feature in the, in the latest few years. So how have you, you know, from your time in Trade Gecko, like how do you actually learn about how to build a really really good experience for a bot, especially in Singapore where Siri wasn't even successful or a company like Apple wasn't successful? How have you built a bot that has become so popular with the Singapore local culture? And how do you actually win a hackathon in just 52 hours with another bot? Where do you start? Like, how, how can bot enthusiasts begin their journey? Uh, okay, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> but uh, in general, the question is, how has your experience in Trade Gecko and my previous company helped me do this? How, and how have I learned so much about it uh, in such a short amount of time? Well, previously I was in this startup called Trade Gecko. If you guys have heard of them, they're an inventory management SaaS platform. Uh, that aims to help younger businesses manage the back ends of their business. So I really, really, really like Trade Gecko because Trade Gecko is one SaaS platform that makes something so boring, like managing Excel sheets in a business, actually fun and actually interesting to use. Trade Gecko is very, very design heavy. Um, when I was there, we had 15 engineers, but 11 designers. So we were actually very, very design heavy. And um, that actually taught me a lot about how to think more about users' perspectives. Like previously, I was more of a, a typical back-end developer like who really had no idea what the user was going to do on the screen at any time. 
Like normally I'd just say it works. But at Trade Gecko, uh, I'd have a lot of conversations with my designer friends and we'd have like really interesting uh, arguments on saying why a button should have a three pixel radius rather than a 10 pixel radius. So I learned a lot about design from Trade Gecko and that actually helped me kind of translate some design part of it into the experience of Bus Uncle as well. Um, and I guess how I learned like so much about chatbots in a short amount of time is just because when Bus Uncle went viral, another thing I learned from Trade Gecko is we got to track everything. We got to track your data across every single interface, right? So when Bus Uncle was launched, I had installed tracking, so I knew every time a user even said the word hi or bye, I knew every single time a user felt sad in a part of a conversation, I'd been tracking so much about it. Because I'd been tracking so much about it, I'd have all these dashboards in the back that show uh, my chatbot analytics like success rates and retention and failure rates. And through this, I'd actually kind of learn and optimize a lot. Uh, on how to make the experience better. So it's primar primarily, I guess, it's just because I got a lot of data and I'd been tracking it that I'd learned a lot about this stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Avilash. Yeah. Thank you so much.